Welcome everyone to uh, this uh, coaching seminar. Uh, it's our, my pleasure to introduce uh, Elliot Kaplan from Fields Institute and McMaster University. And he'll speak about generic derivations on ominimal structures. Okay, um, thank you, Ronnie. And thank you to all of the organizers for inviting me. Um, I should first mention that uh, basically all of this is joint work with uh, Anton Julio Fornasiero. Um, and as I was talking about with Alexi at the beginning, uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of model theoretic notation and definitions that I'll talk about in the latter half. I'll try my best to sort of uh, explain these things and explain how they relate to something that perhaps people are more familiar with, like differentially closed fields. Um, but if I don't do a good enough job, please don't hesitate to stop me or you know, don't hesitate to stop me if there are any other questions. Um, and then the last few slides are, um, involve sort of a generalization. So if I don't get to that, or if I get to it um, after the break, um, that's totally fine. So um, please don't hesitate to slow me down if anything is confusing. Right, so before talking about uh, what I mean by generic derivations on minimal structures, I just wanna talk about derivations on minimal structures. And I wanna start with an example, which is hopefully familiar to uh, many of the people in the seminar. Um, that's the example of Hardy fields. So if we have a function uh, on the real, so unary function, uh, the germ at plus infinity of this function is just the equivalence class of all other functions um, which agree with this function from some point onwards. Um, and I'll denote the uh, germ of f at infinity by brackets f. And then a Hardy field is just a collection of these germs, which is number one, a field, um, a priori, any sort of like, all these germs form a ring, but we want to also be able to uh, find inverses. And uh, number two, which is closed under differentiation, which means that if a uh, germ of some function belongs to a Hardy field, then the germ of its derivative should too. In particular, these functions should be eventually differentiable. Um, and these are introduced by Hardy. Um, I guess he introduced a specific Hardy field, the, uh, the field of logarithmic exponential functions. These are just functions which are sort of built out of uh, logarithms, exponentials, polynomials, things like that. And I guess his big sort of Theorem was that these actually do form a Hardy field. Um, a few examples. Uh, first of all, the sort of trivial Hardy field is the reals themselves, where we identify each real number with the germ of the constant function, which takes constant value of that real number. Um, some other examples are R adjoined the germ of the identity function. And you can just sort of view this as like the, no the normal, like uh, rational function field R of X. Um, and you can also take x along with e to the x and log of x. And this is sort of approaching Hardy's um, logarithmic exponential functions, except they'd have to join a lot more exponentials and logarithms and like nest them and stuff like that to get that full field. Um, a couple of things that don't belong to Hardy fields are things like cosine of x and x minus sine of x. Cosine of x is an oscillating function, so there's no way that I could possibly find an inverse of it. Um, x minus sine of x does not like oscillate over the x-axis, but Hardy fields have to be closed under taking derivatives. So once I take the, uh, say, second derivative of this, I get the sine of x, and this is also oscillating. Um, however, something like the germ of sine of x inverse does, and this is basically because sine of x doesn't oscillate near zero, so sine of x inverse doesn't oscillate near infinity. Um, The picture I like to draw for Hardy fields is sort of like this. So I consider all of the graphs of my functions. I draw this red line at infinity. And then the germs are sort of where these functions hit the red line. Um, so we should note here that not only is a Hardy field a differential field, it's actually an ordered differential field, right? This is why I drew this as a straight line because I can always compare these terms. Um, and this is basically just because, you know, I have to be able to uh, divide. So it sort of falls out of the axioms that these are always an ordered field. Um, so in the 90s, uh, it sort of came to be realized that Hardy fields are very connected to um, O-minimality, which is this sort of area of model theory, um, which seeks to sort of take things that are known about uh, semi-algebraic sets and uh, sort of axiomatize these nice properties and show how they apply to other subsets of the reals, like sub-analytic sets, for instance. So I'll say a little bit more. Um, so first of all, let's let R be any expansion of the real field. Um, then we can consider this following uh, ring, which is H of R. This is just the germs of F, where F is some R-definable unary function. So for example, if R is the expansion of the real field by the exponential, I'd have all the sort of germs of rational functions. 
I'd have the germs of the germ of the exponential function. I'd have the germs of any sort of exponential polynomials, um, and then possibly a lot of different other terms. Like for example, the logarithm might not be in my language per se, but it's certainly a definable function, right? Because it's the compositional inverse of a definable function. So the germ of the logarithm would be there, in there as well. And the big fact is that this ring is a Hardy field um, if and only if this expansion of the real field is O minimal. Um, and O minimality means that all of the definary, or sorry, all of the definable unary sets of uh, my structure are just finite unions of points and open intervals. Um, so maybe it takes a, a little bit of thought to see why the real field itself is O minimal, but once you sort of know a quantifier elimination, then you can say, okay, basically every, um, every subset of the reals which is definable is going to either be a zero set of a polynomial, which is just a collection of points, or some set where the polynomial is bigger than zero or smaller than zero. And these will just be collections of open intervals and then Boolean combinations of these sorts of sets. Um, right, so this fact is pretty easy to prove, but it's very useful in studying O minimal structures. Um, so it was first observed by Van Andrews, McIntyre and Merker. And they used this to show that the expansion of the real field by both the exponential function and all restricted analytic functions is O minimal. And when I say restricted analytic functions, this means uh, I take something like, you know, sine, but I don't uh, include it on the entire real line. I just include it on some compact set. And usually people just choose this compact set to be the closed interval from minus one to one. Um, and I do this for analytic functions, real analytic functions of any arity. Um, so this was sort of the first big use of the facts. Um, and this uses one direction that if this ring is a Hardy field, then the expansion is a minimal. Um, using the other direction was uh, uh, Chris Miller used this to show that any O minimal expansion of the reals, um, which does not define the exponential function is polynomially bounded. And what this means is that every definable function is eventually bounded by a polynomial or more simply a function X to the N. So there he used, um, he assumed that the expansion was O minimal. He used that then the, um, this ring here is a Hardy field. And then he used some facts about Hardy fields due to Rosenlicht to uh, um, deduce this uh, theorem. Okay, um, so I wanna sort of talk about this particular construction that Ben and Jews, McIntyre and Marker do in their paper where they, uh, they prove this O minimality result. Um, I'm again going to let R be an expansion of the reals, but now I'm going to assume that R is a minimal. Um, an R Hardy field, I'm going to define to be a Hardy field, which is closed under all R definable functions. What this means is that if I have some germs G1 through Gn in my Hardy field and some R definable function F, then I can consider the composite function F of G1 through Gn, and I'm going to require that this germ is also in my Hardy field. Um, so for example, if R is the reals with the exponential function, um, I'll require that anytime I have a germ in my Hardy field, that the exponential of that germ is in my Hardy field and the logarithm is in, of that germ is in my Hardy field, and then possibly some other things, right? Because there might be other R definable functions. Um, in fact, there are a lot more R definable functions. Um, a few examples, R itself is an R Hardy field, as is this ring H of R um, on the previous page. So I'm assuming that R is O minimal, right? So we already know that this is a Hardy field. Um, and in fact, basically by the definition, right? These are just the germs of definable functions and the composition of definable functions is definable. So this is actually going to be an R Hardy field. Um, real closed Hardy fields containing the reals um, are R Hardy fields. Um, whenever I use this blackboard R, this I just mean the real field itself without any sort of like additional structure. Um, so basically being an R Hardy field in this sense just means being closed under all semi-algebraic functions, which is the same as being real closed. Um, and then R and Hardy fields, these are sort of the key tool in this aforementioned proof that R and X is O minimal due to Van Entries, McIntyre and Marker. Um, so if I'm considering an R Hardy field H, um, of course this is a Hardy field, it has a derivation on it, but there's actually a natural way to expand H to an L structure. And this is pretty straightforward. You do exactly what you think. So um, I would identify any constant symbol in my language with uh, the germ of the constant functions, uh, the corresponding constant function. Um, if I have a function symbol in my language, I say that uh, the function symbol applied to some germs is just, just the germ of the function symbol applied to, um, 
some uh, representative functions. And then if R is a relation symbol in my language, um, I say that the Hardy field believes that R holds for some tuple of germs, if and only if uh, my sort of base field, uh, my base expansion of the reals, believes that R holds for the corresponding functions evaluated at X eventually, where eventually means for all sufficiently large X. Um, and you might say, well, okay, is this like a well-defined thing? Um, is this either like it holds eventually or doesn't? And uh, the reason that this works is because I'm assuming that R is O-minimal. So it requires some sort of uh, basic facts about O-minimal expansions that uh, this, is, uh, this is either going to hold eventually or it won't hold eventually. Um, and then the, the sort of fact about um, this is that this expansion of my Hardy field is actually an elementary extension of R. Um, this is not involving the derivation at all, just as an L structure, um, this expansion is an elementary extension of R. Um, again, it's sort of like a concrete example. If I have, say, um, my expansion R is equal to the real field with the exponential function, um, then I would interpret the exponential function applied to a germ as just the germ of the exponential function applied to some, um, applied to some representative function. Okay, this construction is a little bit uh, tricky. So are there any questions about this uh, so far? Uh, yes, for, for instance, where does uh, L come from? What is L, big L? Oh uh, yeah, so sorry, I should have said, uh, R is an expansion of the real field in some language L. I think I forgot to mention this. So L is just any sort of reasonable language um, in which you can write this expansion. So if R is maybe the real field with uh, the exponential function and all restricted analytic functions, then L would include um, you know, addition, multiplication, the ordering, as well as a function symbol for the exponential function, and then a function symbol for every single um, analytic function, real analytic function, which is always interpreted as its restriction to um, the compact box. Um, and why is it good to know that uh, something is an element of extension? Um, basically, what this means is that, like, uh, Okay, so if R is say the real exponential field, um, then not only do I know, so a priori if H is an R Hardy field, then H is closed under exponentials and logarithms. Um, but knowing that it's an elementary extension means that um, essentially um, any sort of elementary statement, which is true about the, uh, the uh, real exponential field is also going to be true of H. So any sort of like, uh, um, you know, does this, exponential polynomial have a solution? Does it not? Things like this. Um, so basically, in particular, uh, these two things, H and R are elementary equivalent. Um, in particular, we know like R is always going to be real closed. So in this situation, H will also always be real closed. Um, I guess also another thing that I'll be using is that um, as just an L structure, H is also going to be O minimal because R is assumed to be O minimal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, we have this, uh, we have this R Hardy field H. Um, we have this uh, O minimal structure on it, this additional O minimal structure. But since it's a Hardy field, it also comes with a derivation, right? Which I'll denote by delta. And um, the derivation of a germ will, of course, just be the germ of the derivative of uh, some representative function. Um, so we know that this is a derivation, but we might ask, like, how does this interact with the additional L structure? So like, if I added an exponential function, how does this interact with the new exponential function? Um, and answering this question is pretty easy. It'll just use the chain rule from basic calculus. So if we sort of parse the definitions, let's let f be any zero definable um, C1 function with open domain U. Um, and let's let G be some tuple of germs which lies in this open set U. Um, so I wanna ask, what is the derivative of f applied to these germs? So just parsing the definitions, um, f applied to these germs is going to be the derivative of the sort of composite function, f composed with uh, some representative functions. Um, the fact that I can bring this f inside and sort of apply it to representative functions for these terms um, uses the previous fact that h is an elementary extension of r. Um, and then just by definition, taking the derivative of this term, I can just bring it inside and take the derivative of this composite function. 
uh, sorry. Yeah, on this line, I'm just applying the chain rule from elementary calculus. So this is the gradient of F applied to these germs times the derivative of these germs. And then I'm just pulling everything back outside. So the gradient of F is going to be a zero definable map. Um, and uh, the derivative of these germs is just, um, I mean, I guess the, yeah, the derivative of these germs is just the germ of these derivatives. So I can sort of like parse everything back out. Um, and so this isn't really saying very much. This is just basically saying that the chain rule holds for, uh, for you know, differentiable real functions. Um, but now I'm going to sort of take this, you know, observation on the last slide and actually make this into a uh, definition. Um, so this is where the model theory sort of starts to come in. So, you know, of course, please slow me down if anything's unclear. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to let T be a complete, model complete, O minimal L theory. I'm extending the theory of real closed fields and I'll let K be a model of T. Um, I'm assuming completeness and model completeness mostly for convenience. Um, basically any sort of natural O minimal um, expansion of the real field you might think of uh, satisfies these conditions. So like the, the theory of um, the real field with the exponential, this is complete and model complete due to uh, Alex Wilkie. Um, if I take the real field with an exponential function and all of these restricted analytic functions, this is complete and uh, model complete due to uh, Van Andries and uh, Miller. Um, so these are just some sort of uh, technical assumptions. Um, right, but I'm not necessarily going to assume that T is the theory of some expansion of the real field. I mean, you can sort of uh, assume this if you like, but we could also assume that T is any sort of general or minimal theory. Um, and this just means that every model of T or equivalently any model of T has this property that every definable unary set is a, uh, a finite collection or a finite union of points and open intervals. Okay. And then the main definition is the definition of a T derivation. And this is just a map on my O minimal structure K, um, which satisfies this property on the previous slide. It satisfies the channel property. So the derivative of F of U is the gradient of F at U uh, times the derivative of U. Whenever I have a zero definable uh, continuously differentiable function F um, with open domain and where U is in this domain. Okay, so this is the, uh, the sort of the main definition of this uh, talk. Um, I guess uh, most of my sort of uh, thesis is uh, involving different sort of uses of this definition in different contexts. Um, but this generic derivations thing is going to be a specific context that I worked on with um, Anton Giulio Fernasio. Right. I want to give a few uh, examples. Um, any derivation on a real closed ordered field is an RCF derivation. Um, I should maybe say on this previous slide that I didn't require a T derivation to be a derivation. I just required that it be a map that satisfies this. But if I apply this to the function um, x plus y and the function x times y, it's very easy to check that anything satisfying this property is automatically going to be a derivation on k. Um, and if uh, my theory t is just RCF, these are the only things you need to check. So any, any derivation is automatically an RCF derivation. Um, Tx derivations arise when studying uh, exponential algebraicity and various uh, Schenuel type properties, um, especially in work by um, John, Jonathan Kirby and Alex Wilkie. Um, so here Tx is just the theory of the real exponential field. Um, it turns out that Tx derivations are exactly the derivations um, which uh, sort of behave well with the exponential function. So the derivations for which uh, the derivative of X of A is equal to X of A times the derivative of A. Um, I guess uh, some of you might have seen uh, the this field T of uh, logarithmic exponential trans series, perhaps in uh, previous talks by uh, Lev Andrews or his collaborators or his students. Um, this doesn't play a key role in the talk, so I'm not really going to define it. Um, but I will say that. Um, it admits a natural expansion to a model of T and X. That is the theory of the real field with uh, restricted analytic functions and the exponential function. Um, the exponential function, if you've seen the construction of this thing is sort of baked in there. And then restricted analytic functions sort of arise because this is a, uh, a field of 
a formal series. So it sort of makes sense to talk about analytic functions. Um, and the natural derivation on this field is a TNX derivation. So part of my sort of uh, motivation for introducing these derivations is to uh, study this uh, specific expansion of uh, th this field of trans series. And then the same is true for uh, surreal numbers equipped with the uh, derivation on the surreal numbers uh, defined by Verducci and Montova. So the last two examples, um, if you haven't seen them before, that's okay. They're not gonna play a big role. But uh, if you have seen them before, this is sort of like some of the motivation for introducing these uh, T derivations. Okay. Um, I wanna talk about, um, I guess, sort of a, a basic thing you can do with T derivation sort of analogy to a differential algebraic closure. So I'll let K, um, I guess maybe I haven't defined this yet, which is, uh, yeah. So let's let just K be a model of T and let's let uh, delta be a T derivation on K. Um, I'll let A be an element of K. I'll let B be a subset of K. Um, I'll define this, uh, I guess, I call it the jet of A. So this just J delta infinity of A. This is just going to be the tuple A, delta A, delta squared A, and so on. Um, and then same for the jet of B, which is just going to be um, the, the jets of all of the, um, the elements in B. And so we can define this uh, closure operator, this delta closure operator. So we'll say that um, A is in the delta closure of B. If um, the rank of this um, jet of A over the jet of B is finite, where this rank here, this rank subscript L, is just the rank arising from definable closure in my model of T. So um, if you haven't seen uh, much O minimality, this might be a little bit confusing, but basically any sort of O minimal, uh, uh, o -minimal structure, especially an O minimal expansion of a field, um, has this sort of natural closure operator, definable closure. Um, it's, uh, it comes with this, uh, this rank associated to it. Um, and then I can sort of uh, define this new closure operator um, by saying basically that there's some uh, definable uh, definable relationship between A and all of its derivatives um, where I'm allowed to use parameters from B and their derivatives. So um, I guess as a concrete example, um, if uh, my theory T is just the theory RCF, then this definable closure will be the same as algebraic closure. And this uh, delta closure will be the same as differential algebraic closure. Um, so this is just sort of an analog of differential algebraic closure that makes sense in this O minimal setting. Um, and then the main proposition about these is that uh, this differential algebraic closure is a pregeometry, which basically means that um, I can sort of talk about um, differential algebraic dependent, independence. I can talk about differential algebraic uh, um, ranks of some you know, tuple, and this all makes sense. It's all well-defined. Um, Right. Um, any questions about this? I realize that this is sort of a little bit maybe confusing if you haven't seen um, definable closure in the minimal setting. But basically for all intents and purposes, one should just think about this as basically saying that there is a version of differential algebraic closure that makes sense in our setting. And I'll be using this um, delta closure operator a little bit later. Okay. Um, yeah, so let me set up some notation. I'll let L delta be my language L. This is the language um, of my original O minimal theory T, along with the new function symbol for delta, which is of course going to be interpreted as the derivation. I'll let T delta um, be the L delta theory, which extends T by an axiom scheme asserting that delta is a T derivation. Being a T derivation is a first order axiomatizable thing. I just have to say that Anytime I have a, function or a definable function, it satisfies this, uh, this chain rule. Um, so yeah, I should have said what T delta is before the previous slide, but uh, here it is now. Um, so the models of T delta are exactly the models of T equipped with a T derivation. Um, let's let K um, along with this delta be a model of T delta, which again, just means that K models T and delta is a T derivation on K. Um, We'll say that uh, delta is uh, generic 
if for every um, definable set with parameters from K, and this is L definable, so not using delta at all in the definition, if every LK definable set A, um, such that the, so A is going to live in K to the N minus, or sorry, K to the N plus one, and I'm going to require that the projection of A to the first N coordinates is full dimension, um, which basically just is the same thing as saying that it has a non-empty interior. Um, then I should be able to find some A and K um, such that A along with delta A up through the nth derivative of A uh, lives inside of this definable set A. So this is going to be, um, this sort of uh, definition gives us an axiom scheme and we'll say that delta is generic if it satisfies this axiom scheme. Um, and in a couple of pages, I'll give some alternative axiomatizations. Um, I'll let T delta G be the L delta theory, which extends um, T delta by the axiom scheme, asserting that delta is generic. So this is something first order, right? I just have to say for every definable set, I can always find some point, you know, any definable set satisfying this uh, condition that its projection has non-empty interior. I can always find some point such that it and its uh, successive derivatives look inside of this set. Um, and so the main theorem by uh, Anton Giulio and I is that this theory T delta G is the model completion of T delta. Um, what does model completion mean? Uh, this is the same as basically saying that um, the models of this theory T delta G are exactly the existentially closed models of T delta. So if I have some sort of uh, model of T delta G and I have some sort of formula um, involving parameters from that model maybe, um, and this formula has a witness in a bigger model of T delta, then it actually has a witness in my model of T delta G. So basically any sort of, uh, any sort of condition that's met in some T delta ex extension of my model of T delta G is actually, you can actually solve it in my model of T delta G itself. Um, and if T has quantified elimination and universal axiomatization, then T delta G is quantified elimination. Universal axiomatization basically just means that any substructure of a model of T is itself a model of T, um, which is just sort of a technical assumption that you can always sort of um, arrange by possibly extending my language in which T is written. So basically, uh, this just means that uh, T delta G sort of has quantified elimination relative to my base theory T. Um, and this is sort of, a, I guess, a, you know, a usual thing that model theorists like to do is they sort of take some uh, basic theory, which describes a lot of interesting models. And they asked if this basic theory have a model companion or a model completion. Um, so for example, the, the model completion, I think of the, the theory of uh, differential fields of characteristic zero is just going to be the theory of differentially closed fields of characteristic zero. Um, model completion, sorry? Does this tell you how to do the quantify elimination? Um, No, not really. It uses one of these sorts of uh, tests, um, I guess, Bloom's criterion specifically. Um, so you, you don't actually prove this by like actually doing a quantifier elimination. You just use some uh, embedding lemmas and you can deduce that it has quantifier elimination. Um, so I will give an application of quantifier elimination on the next slide that doesn't really involve, um, you know, getting your hands dirty and proving it, but uh, yeah, you don't actually have an effective way to do this. Um, so an easy corollary of this is that T delta G is complete. Um, it's a complete theory. Um, remember at the very beginning, I assumed that T was complete. So um, it's sort of complete relative to T, I guess. Um, this follows from the fact that uh, T delta has a prime substructure and this quantifier elimination result. So a prime substructure is just going to be a model of T delta, um, which embeds into any model of T delta G. Um, in this case, the prime substructure is going to be the prime model of T equipped with the trivial derivation. Um, we might ask if, uh, so of course this, uh, this prime substructure is not itself a model of T delta G. We might ask if T delta G has a prime model, and this is not true in general, at least when uh, my language is countable. Um, when my language is countable, there's some sort of test that can allow me to show that it, it has no prime model. When the language is uncountable, this test doesn't work, but I'm, I'm not really sure. I would assume that it doesn't have a prime model in any, um, in any case. Um, another corollary which uses this quantified elimination result is that we have a very sort of explicit def uh, characterization of the definable sets in terms of uh, definable sets in my base theory. So if K is a model of T delta G, 
then for any uh, definable set where now I'm allowed to use this function symbol delta, um, I can find some m and a um, L definable set um, where I'm no longer using delta um, and possibly higher arity such that the L delta definable set A is exactly the points in K to the N such that A delta A up through delta M of A is uh, in this, uh, um, this definable set, this L definable set uh, tilde A. So um, the same is basically true in differentially closed fields of characteristic zero. Um, any definable set there looks like the points uh, such that they and their successive derivatives belong to some constructible set. So this is just sort of the, the, the correct analog in our setting of this fact. And this just falls right out of quantifier elimination. It takes maybe a little bit of work, but... Um, and then a corollary, um, I guess, for the model theorists is that this theory, TDG, is uh, distal. Um, so for non-model theorists, distality is one of these sort of model theoretic combinatorial properties. Um, distal theories are sort of a subclass of NIP theories in which everything is sort of governed by this uh, this linear order, um, but it's it's not really important for this talk exactly what distality means. Um, I'll just say that the proof of it basically follows from this corollary and the fact that T is itself distal, um, and that this corollary was one of the sort of main motivations um, from a model theoretic perspective for sort of uh, um, doing this work. Um, but yeah, if you're not familiar with distality, it doesn't really uh, matter so much. Okay, so yeah, I said I would talk about some alternative axiomatizations. So the following are equivalent. Um, first of all, the axioms that I stated where you have a set in uh, K to the N plus one with open projection, and I find some point such that that point and its derivatives are in the set. Um, the second equivalent definition is this sort of uh, order one definition. So I have a definable set in K to the two N, um, again, I'm going to require that its projection onto the first n coordinates has full dimension n. Um, then I require that there is some a in k to the n such that the tuple a, along with the derivatives of this tuple a, are in x. Um, so going from definition two and showing that this implies one is basically the usual trick of uh, breaking down a higher order differential uh, condition into a bunch of first order differential conditions. Um, going from one to two, I really sort of go through um, this model completeness result. So I, I you know, have a model of TDG. Um, I take my set X. I can find a point that looks like this in some extension of my model. And then I use model completeness or existential closeness to bring the solution down to my model. Um, and this third condition says that for any um, definable function F um, with open domain, uh, open and non-empty domain, I can find some point A such that the first n minus one derivatives of A lie in this um, open set and such that the nth derivative of A is equal to F applied to the first n minus one derivatives of A. Um, so you can sort of view this as being a special case of the axiom scheme for one where I apply the axiom scheme for one to the graph of F. Um, going the other direction essentially uses that uh, ominimal theories have this property called definable choice. So anytime I have some sort of set, I can find a definable sort of uh, choice function for this set. And then F will be, um, I'll basically apply three to the definable choice function to get one. And then if T is equal to RCF, then this theory TDG coincides with the theory of closed order differential fields as defined by um, Michael Singer. And uh, I guess the thing that sort of looks closest to uh, Singer's axiomatization is this, uh, axiom scheme three. Um, so if you sort of replace this function f um, with say a, a differential polynomial and you assume that u is sort of defined by a bunch of differential polynomial inequalities, then you require basically exactly uh, Singer's axiomatization for closed order differential fields. Um, so in particular, any model of TDG expands a closed order differential field. It's exactly the same when t is just RCF, but if t is a richer theory, then there are more conditions that uh, need to be satisfied. Uh, so in number two, is it necessary to consider n uh, greater than one? Um, yes, it should be, uh, yeah, it should be necessary to consider n greater than one because you'll have like a higher order stuff that you want to sort of break into components. 
yeah, n equals one would really only say that like order one uh, differential conditions are satisfied. Um, yeah, so you really need this to hold for all n. Same with the axiomatization of TDG. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I guess now that we sort of know, um, now that we know how things look, um, now that we know like quantified elimination and stuff like this, we can sort of get into some of the model theoretic properties of these things. So the first thing that model theorists would like to do is, uh, you know, see if there's like a, a well-defined sort of dimension on definable sets. Um, in this case, there is, and it uses this delta closure operator. So um, if A is a delta closed subset of a model of TDG, um, then A along with this restricted derivation um, is itself a model of TDG. And uh, one can use this in some results of Anton Julio, some sort of like more abstract model theoretic results to define a uh, dimension undefinable sets as follows. So what I'll do is I'll take my, um, my model uh, of TDG, I'll consider an elementary extension of this model, um, which is uh, K plus saturated. So this is a model theoretic term, but basically what this just means is that this extension is very rich. Um, and uh, I'll let A be some definable set with parameters in K. So I want to sort of uh, give a dimension to these K definable sets. Um, and then I define the dimension, the delta dimension of A to be as follows. I look at all of the points in M, um, which lie in the set A, and I take the maximum delta rank of these points over K, where delta rank is the rank arising from this delta closure. So um, a couple of things to say. First of all, you need to know that this delta closure is a pre-geometry to make sense of things like delta rank and make sure these are all well-defined. Um, and then secondly, um, the, uh, the assumption that uh, this extension is K plus saturated is basically just needed to make sure that I can always sort of like uh, find this point of maximal rank. Um, so basically the assuming that this is K plus saturated means that this really doesn't depend on my choice of the model M. Um, I can choose any sufficiently saturated model M and calculate the dimension of A there and it won't be uh, different if I go to different models. Um, and when I say well-behaved dimension function, I just mean that like, you know, the normal things you would want to happen, happen. So like the dimension of the whole, uh, um, the dimension of K itself will be one. Um, the dimension of uh, any point will be zero. The dimension of a product of definable sets will just be the sum of the dimensions of these sets. Um, dimension uh, is preserved under definable bijections, you know, things sort of like that. Um, and then I'll also mention, I'll also mention here, and I won't go into this, that uh, this theory has a type of cell decomposition. Um, and this is essentially due to uh, this theorem by uh, Brie, Michaud, and Riviere on a cell decomposition theory for uh, closed order differential fields. So their proof of this works just as well in our case. And dimension can also be defined using this uh, decomposition. So I won't say what this decomposition is. I'll just say that it gives another way to uh, look at definable sets and talk about um, dimension. OK. Um, so I realized that now it's about 11.50. Um, should I go on for another slide or two, or should I uh, stop here for the breakout rooms? Um, I can talk about some of the things maybe after the break, if that's it's, uh, it's, uh, that's good. it's a good place to stop. Uh, so all right, so let us uh, thank uh, Elliot for his beautiful talk. Thank you. So at this point, do we have any questions uh, for Elliot? Uh, what would you say would be um, uh, interesting non-model theoretic uh, implications of this? Um, yeah, so I guess uh, sort of the, the non-model theoretic um, applications more involve models of TD than TDG. So I sort of gave a lot of like concrete examples of models of TD, like the Hardy Fields example, the, um, the uh, trans series examples, things like that. Um, these sort of involve usually some more complicated tools to study. Um, the whole approach to this is very model theoretic, but like to study these other things, you need some like valuation theoretic machinery, um, stuff like this. 
Um, however, I would say that like uh, the sort of uh, in developing the theory of TDG, I sort of had to develop, you know, Anton Julio and I sort of had to develop an extension theory for models of TD. So like, what are the extensions of models of TD? Um, what do these things sort of look like? And these play a big role in these other applications. Um, I guess I would also say that maybe um, well, minimality seems like sort of a, uh, um, it might seem like sort of an arbitrary setting in which to study these things. And the, the reason for studying O minimal um, things is basically because of the like Hardy field and Chen series examples. Um, but I could also see maybe using this approach um, and other sort of expansions of fields by operators. So maybe like valued fields expanded by um, analytic functions or things like this. Um, I think that some of this approach could be useful there. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is Michael Singer. I, I have a, uh, a question kind of related to Alexei's question. Mm -hmm. So for, for real fields, um, elimination of quantifiers gives you an easy proof that a, um, the closure of a definable set is, or the closure of a set defined by equalities and less, and less than or equal mm -hmm. uh, is again defined in that way. Mm -hmm. Right. So is there a topology on the functions in a Hardy field, which would tell you that the limit of certain functions are again definable in, in, in these terms? Does, am, does the question make sense? Yeah. Um... So this would be an application of elimination of quantifiers. Right. Um, I guess I should say that uh, these uh, these uh, T delta G theories uh, do not have Hardy field models. So um, I think sort of developing uh, an elimination of quantifiers for certain Hardy fields, you know, this is something that would take a lot more work to do. Um, well, or or I mean, these closed order differential fields. Well, th there there's a kind of Seinberg representation theorem, right? You can mm -hmm. represent certain things in terms of power series. So you do have functions that you can get your hands on. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you apply, you know, some of your ideas, is there any sense in which one can define a topology on these things and take limits of functions when you actually do have functions? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about this. Um, I will say um, maybe these are, this is not so related to the question you're asking. Um, in their paper, Brie, Michelle, and Riviere define this uh, sort of new topology called the delta topology on closed order differential fields. Um, and this can be, I mean, we didn't do it in our paper, but this can be uh, defined as well in our setting. Um, and then also, I guess this is sort of on a, a future slide, so maybe I can talk about this a little bit uh, after the break, but um, we do have uh, sort of a result on what the closures of definable sets look like, where closure is with respect to the normal sort of order topology. Uh -huh. um, um, okay, so that's um, kind of answering yeah. what I'm asking. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I have a question about a slide you had early on where you showed yeah, about sure. four functions. Um, the question about how you're ordering uh, in, in this uh, field, um, you showed. Yeah, so is this for the picture that I showed? Yes. Yeah, let me try to go back there. there that go. one, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I, um, I mean, you're just ordering those because at this point, one is greater than the other, uh, but I'm sorry, at which, but which x value are you? I mean, that seems to be arbitrary. That's what I don't understand. I mean, you're, you're ranking the functions. I mean, you're ordering the functions or the germs. Yeah. But 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 at which point are you? Okay, it, are you ranking them? I guess that's that's what I'm. Yeah. So x here is the identity function. Um, right. and basically, I guess it's not in the definition of a Hardy field, but it follows from this requirement that everything be. Um, uh, eventually continuous, eventually differentiable, eventually invertible, that given any two germs in my Hardy field, right. um, either they're eventually equal 
oh, or wow. eventually one will always be bigger than the other. And so you can order them based on that. Oh, okay, it will be, I'm sorry. Um, if I think, okay. Yeah. So it's sort of like a rate, rate, rate of growth thing, I guess. Um, so like something like uh, X to the minus one, even though it's limit is zero, I would say it's bigger than zero because it's bigger than zero for you know all X. And then one is bigger than that because it's bigger than X inverse for all X bigger than one. Again, log X is bigger than that, X is bigger than that. So it's sort of a rate of growth thing. I, I just wasn't sh uh, sure you got the quantifiers right. Now I realize you guess you do it. Okay. Okay, cool. Mm. All right, uh, any other question? Okay, so if we don't, uh, let's take a break and then uh, uh, we'll have, we'll ask Elliot more questions that we'll have a chance to talk to us about more things. <laughs>